Yeah, in light of the last speaker, I should really start by thanking you. Uh, personally, I'll actually only speak, I'll only thank you if you manage to save for the full duration. Uh, that's my thoughts on it. So, uh, I'm from the University of Limerick. If you have a look at the title, it'll give you an insight into what I'm here to talk about. I'm from a research group. Um, I'm a research psychologist working with the HRI, and I'm also a scientist practitioner. So what that means is I work as a practice in psychology, as a consultant for two years to Munster Rugby, as well as being a, a research psychologist. So, it's st in the title I mentioned, just one thing, and said that we're looking at high performance. So these are two high performers, which give us some examples or insights into mental health issues. So, if you're not aware of it, I'm sure you are, mental health within the Irish context, we, we win all the medals uh, in terms of mental health stigma. So we have real challenges across Irish society dealing with mental health problems. So, for example, Jesse Barr um, and Carl Sheridan are researchers at the University of Limerick who are looking into this. There's a lot of research on things like um, the fact that mental health stigma is actually higher among athlete groups because of uh, partly because of the language we use and partly because there's an acceptance for uh, using the mind as something you can exploit rather than something you can use and, and focus on well-being. Um, so Jessie did her um, master's studies in England and they were looking at depression uh, and experience of elite male athletes. Now what happened is she set out to interview athletes, male and female. Uh, they were mainly uh, Irish athletes she was looking at. When she sent out um, an invite to participate in the study, it was predominantly male athletes that fitted the criteria. The criteria were that they had publicly acknowledged they had suffered from depression. That's kind of interesting uh, because female athletes hadn't gone through such public disclosures, perhaps because they'd sought treatment along the way. So we're actually talking about primarily a male problem here, is males hiding and not revealing their psychological distress until the end of their career. So you can take your examples, and it's not exclusively a male issue. If you look at UK sport, and I prefer to use UK examples and Irish ones, um, because Ireland's too small a place, but take, for example, Victoria Pendleton, uh, suffered from depression, Johnny Wilkinson, even being a stellar rugby player, you know, using the, an example of somebody who was resilient, uh, came out and said he suffered from depression for more than a decade. So that's kind of interesting if anybody knows the word resilient. Resilient should be adaptive, so it should be good for your mental health. So you're not, by definition, resilient if you're suffering from, from depression for a decade because you're not engaging in adaptive behaviours. It's probably being a little harsh, you know, we don't know what challenges he went through uh, or what, so what help he sought during that time. But it's an interesting thing. So athletes are a subgroup of the population who are at high risk of psychological distress for obvious reasons. They go through lots of transitions, they suffer injury. I worked for two years at Munster Rugby. At one stage, more than half of our elite players were out injured, i.e. off roster, not available to play. So some of those injuries were career terminating, some are three to six months out. During that time, people, these athletes typically suffer from mild to moderate depression. Phrases within the language of sport, uh, and certainly sports journalists have committed a crime every time they use the word mental toughness. The reason is because mental toughness suggests that there's some sort of corollary to this, mental weakness. That's a real challenge. Mental toughness and phrases like this actually challenge the mental health and well-being of athletes. Once that's your ideal, it's very hard to athlete, for athletes and players to come forth or disclose about any form of weakness. What the effect of mental health stigma across the board is it leads to mislabeling and what we call uh, social stigma. So there's a stigma around those who have disclosed or are seeking help. Athletes who've come forward and are working with consultants, for example, or are going to their practitioner or are undergoing treatment for depression, for example. The second type, that's a mislabeling. The se second type is what we call self-stigma. And this is an interesting idea. Basically means that people are service averse. So more than 90% of people that suffer from depression don't seek help. Now, depression, depending on which theorist you buy into, whether it's Martin Seligman or others, is readily treatable. It's very rare that depression uh, doesn't respond to some form of treatment. The issue is people don't seek treatment, and this is even more so, not just within sport, but particularly within student-athlete 
So student athletes are an increasing you know, body of, uh, uh, of a sample within the, the college, college context. And they suffer lots of transitions, those of a student, exam preparation, exam failure, coursework. Um, at the same time, they also have the dual role, we call dual career issue, of their being under pressure in terms of sport. Now, we see those sport pressures should provide some social support. However, the evidence, there's many papers, including one by Rice in 2016, suggests that athletes are at more at risk than the general population of psychological disorder. Now, that's actually counterintuitive. Because intuitively, if you do sport and physical activity, you should get all these boosts, you should have social support from your teammates. There are many reasons why that environment should buffer your psychological distress. And that isn't the case, which suggests there's something more uh, challenging about high-performance sport. So both Jessie, who can't be here today because she's actually injured at the moment, and Carl has just recently retired from rugby, from Munster Rugby. He's uh, an athlete ambassador for Arupa. The, uh, the, um, that's the Professional Rugby Players Association Union, uh, which uh, advocates well-being for their players. So their, their work and the work of others is ongoing work in Ireland the UK on this, and it is an interesting issue. And it means that if we look at how we can overcome stigma with athletes, we can probably find solutions we can be used with the wider population. So this is just an example of perhaps what I'm not talking about. We're not talking about plugging in, going in the treadmill, carrying your azaleas. What we're actually talking about is nature-based solutions. So nature-based solutions are ways of tackling societal challenges. So anybody knows anything about European funding, societal challenges are acknowledged within uh, the environment and climate change around mental health and promotion of well-being. They're just two examples. But um, certainly the concept I'll be talking to to now about, um, they will be able to have an impact. So I'm part of a research group that we formed about three years ago. Um, a number of researchers across environmental science uh, and other disciplines got together. We were interested in the concept of green exercise, which we'll come to in a moment. But we were also interested in the effects of in human nature interaction on your attitudes towards the environment, on your well-being, and being active in that environment, and what impact that would have upon you physiologically and psychologically. So there are, it's quite, quite a complex area and I'll, I'll try to share with you some of those complexities because of the richness of what that gives in terms of research, in terms of application. So one of our collaborators at the beginning is the Dr. Eve Donnelly. We now work with uh, 12 European partners, both commercial and academic. We're part of uh, our horizon call at the moment is that we have proposals in under review um, and we have a number of Funding, successful, successful funding from different organisations. We've worked with Mental Health Ireland. Uh, Clare Street Park is um, our natural laboratory in Killaloo, where they built this, you know, one and a half million uh, euro investment in a nature trail around a park, which has some football pitches and ancillary facilities. The nature trail, having lived in Killaloo, is the most active. Um, uh, it's more common activity on site. In other words, people buy into the idea of green exercise and using nature to enhance well-being. We work with multi-stakeholder groups, including mental health charities and other sporting organisations, to enhance our capacity to achieve some scientific objectives. And they include implementation on quite a large scale. What it is, is really is mental health by stealth. So, I work at the University of Limerick campus. If on UL campus I say I'm going to have a workshop and it's going to be about mental health for the distressed, I can tell you the five people that will turn up. One will be from counselling, there will be two researchers from psychology and two of my own students. Mental health is a stigmatised term. By definition, mental health includes psychological disorder as well as the other aspects of well-being like thriving. But that's not how we perceive it. It's not how it's readily perceived by the public. So instead, if you want to enhance mental health, give people another mechanism. Don't tell them it's mental health that's after, or that's what you're after. Tell them that this is exercise, or use something which is low stigma. So that's where that concept of green exercise comes in. So if you look at these two images, um, one is obviously a Dublin landmark, uh, and one is could be from Slade Valley, one of the hills less than two miles from here. That it might evoke some images of when you last were outdoors, maybe you went for a walk um, over Christmas, maybe you walked out in the snow last weekend, if you were lucky to have some. So what these 
from a scientific point of view, they allude to two things. One is green exercise and the other is blue mind. So green exercise is physical activity in natural settings. So that could be a walk, could be a jog. It's basically, normally we say it's not goal oriented in the same way purely exercise workouts are. Blue Mind is from Wallace J. Nichols, uh, an American advocate um, and environmentalist, who suggests that when we interact with water, we have a, an indifferent way, to whether we go for a walk by the coast in Hoth, or whether we do out, um, open water swimming, our psychological state changes in a very distinctive way. It turns out from European-wide studies, one is called Phenotype, it's from FP7, they were able to show that proximity to water increases well-being when you control for social economic status and other factors. So living close to water is actually very good for you. So he's an advocate behind this. The other side of a green exercise, there's actually uh, a lot of research being done in this area at the moment and we're part of that uh, initiative. So green exercise, the term is coined um, in 2003 by Barton and Al, but they kind of said it's exposure to nature and physical, physical exercise. We're saying, well, exposure to nature has certain effects, so what are they? So typically what we call negative psychological indices, tension, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion, which are readily tested in questionnaires, these decrease. What increases is vigor or revitalization. It also has been shown tentatively, I would suggest, that to enhance attention and reduce stress when you use physiological measures and measure attention using various means. The question we ask is this, is mere exposure enough or do we have to engage with the risk that rich natural stimuli? So I'll try to give an example. If you run, at, you know, say at 90% of your VO2 max, pretty much flat out, probably only sustain it for three or four minutes. If you're running through a woods, you, all your sensations, all your uh, attentional process are focused on these physiological sensations of effort. So you're trying to make such a high level of effort, you don't have the mental capacity to take, take in your environment. If you're running at half that pace, maybe just about 50%, about you have the capacity to take in your surroundings, to notice it, to actually maintain a conversation with a partner while running, for example. So they're two entirely different states. So we're, we're interested in the idea of how do you get people to notice their environment if they're out in it? Because some people could be out in a natural environment and not take notice of it. Part of that is they might be low in what we call nature affinity. So when we look at their response to environmental stimuli, they, that may, may not be something that's very meaningful to them. However, we have some ways around this. So I'm suggesting that, as in this example, simply being in nature, three concepts, if anyone's familiar with uh, positive psychology, uh, that might come to mind. One is mindfulness, the other is savoring, the other is flow or focus and activity. So mindfulness is a fairly complex construct. It means, it, look, it's, a, it's a probably an overstretched idea. So my mentor in UCD would have been Professor Aidan Morn, recently discussing mindfulness-based intervention. We're saying, well, it's great that many people are mindfulness practitioners are engaging in it, but in terms of research, we're probably overstretching it. Maybe mindfulness, you know, for example, uh, is limited uh, effectiveness for some people. So when I've done training on mindfulness, um, it's come to mind and the research evidence suggests in some clinical group, for some clinical groups, mindfulness training isn't that effective or um, can be counterproductive in terms of negative uh, affect and psychological distress. In fact, you think about mindfulness, you have to have the good degree of psychological literacy, attentional control, and some capacity for self-regulation even to engage it in the first place. So mindfulness is an interesting concept when it comes to green exercise. Flow, or that state which is you know, linked to optimal performance, that's something maybe people can achieve through green exercise. Or maybe they can achieve while they're doing it. And savoring is that kind of recollection of positive past experience. You know, what did I really enjoy last weekend? Those images that come to mind. So these three concepts can add something to our concept of engagement. So we propose a, a set of interventions which um, encourage participants to be mindful of their surroundings. So we will use online training, not specifically in mindfulness, but in terms of awareness of their environment. That'll help, we hope, with their pro-social behavior or their attitudes 
towards the environment. So they get attitudes which are about a more sustainable environment. We'll prioritize, get them to prioritize well-being goals for activity ahead of time or performance goals. So most times when we do exercise prescription, you're told run at a certain certain heart rate for a certain duration, right? So that's very prescriptive. Our goals would be run at a pace you feel comfortable at, enjoy the environment, take uh, time to notice the environmental cues. In fact, we have a protocol which involves um, counterintuitively running with your phone, right? So people want to run with their phone for a number of reasons. One is they don't get lost in the forest, two, they have it for safety, and three, for our purposes, it is, has a unique, unique role. So we propose to use an app, and the app will allow people to take photographs of their phone, and then they can tag these photos with emotions. And this becomes kind of self-reinforcing behavior, because they can look in, back in it and savor the experience very readily. Together, these three concepts offer people the capacity to increase well-being, and not just increase well-being and reduce psychological stress, but to increase adherence. So adherence is the, um, I guess, the holy grail of physical activity research. So most physical activity research by Blumenthal, for example, 2007, would suggest that more than half the people in the physical activity intervention stop within three months. So that's pretty much a killer for those, those interventions, and this obviously has implications for health and well-being of participants. And why is that? Because typically we prescribe um, and it's prescribed, they're not autonomously regulated. So people don't get to choose what type of exercise. They don't get to choose where they're going to do it. They're prescribed gym-based activity, either in isolation or group, and it's usually quite a boring task. It could be, end up, you could end up being on an exercise bike looking at a blank wall or looking at a TV. So some of those concepts of nature are pretty much opposite to that. In nature, you get to choose where you, what type of environment or setting you want to engage in, you get to choose what pace, you get to choose whether it's jog, walk, bike, swim, all different activities. So this leads to what we call a sticky behavior. So sticky behaviors are ones that use multiple neural pathways. So that means they give you very powerful multi-sensory memories. And those powerful multi-sensory memories are really important for what we call implementation intentions. So that's a complex phrase for saying you making a contract with yourself to go exercise again. So that's, that's where we're going with, with that concept. So how it works in practice is, with your phone, you come to, um, maybe it's a, a stream if you're running in a forest. You take a picture of the stream, logical constructs to make this much more meaningful, more persistent and more enjoyable. Um, and just to finish, what I'd like to highlight is what, what we're talking about now is we said there's three things um, about green exercise. One is that, um, to paraphrase Gordon Gecko, green exercise is, is good. Yes, we're not exactly sure for whom or to what effect. It's certainly relative to exercise in gym settings uh, leads to increased well-being. Some of the other areas is only tentative research. Um, green exercise works. This is an interesting question. We have very little understanding of the mechanisms by which it works, and that's a challenge. Um, and green exercise is right. Well, it might be right because, apart from Donald Trump, most of the planet realize that climate change is here, and that's something we can address. So by using green exercise, mental health by stealth, we have a capacity to influence people's attitudes toward the environment, people's attitudes towards themselves, and people's attitudes towards others' mental health. Thank you.